Well, here we are, that magical time when we read The Misses by E.L. James. Chapter 12. Oh, uh, somebody is going to notice my glasses and they're going to say, oh, you got new glasses. And then I am going to feel like a fraud and a liar because I will not have made it clear that my glasses are not new they are just a secondary pair, because if I keep one upstairs and one downstairs, I'll never lose them. All right, chapter 12. Alessia is having a nightmare, and it is a nightmare of word repetition for us. Valeriana, sweet young Valeriana, is outside the locked doors of the ornate reception hall at Angwin House, trying to get in. She rattles the door, banging her fists on the glass of the double doors. On the glass. She'll break the glass. The thing is, banging her fists on the glass of the double doors, I don't think that that is actually a full sentence. Um, it's morning time, and I'm, I'm used to doing these in the evening when I'm a little sharper, but I'm pretty sure that banging her fists on the glass of the double doors is not a full sentence. And she's rattling the door and banging her fists on the glass. On the glass! The glass! Maxim wakes Alessia up because she's having a nightmare. Heart pounding, she opens her eyes, her fear a tight knot in her chest, clawing its way into her throat and choking her. Maxim, her savior, again. Their whole relationship is going to be based on the fact that he saved her. That's the, that's the whole relationship. That's what it's going to be. He asks if she's okay. She's like, it's a bad dream. He should be like, no shit, because she was like screaming in her sleep. That doesn't tend to happen with really great dreams. Her thundering heartbeat slows as she clings to her dear, dear husband and inhales his comforting scent. Body wash, sleep, and Maxim. Just the constant referral to how they smell like themselves constant. There's a POV shift and a section break where the next day is happening and Maxim is going to work. He's going to the office. He says, it's my first day in the office after the tumultuous events of the last few weeks. I don't remember him going, well, I guess he did go to the office, but like I haven't, I don't remember seeing him work and do stuff. I think he went to the office to check in with Oliver in the last, um, the last book. What exactly is this man doing in the office? Dude alert. She always seems so stoic, but perhaps now that she's safe, the shock of the numerous ordeals she's endured recently is finally taking its toll. Dude, it's one nightmare. Like, yeah, obviously she's traumatized. She has, like, PTSD. She's been, like, human trafficked. She's been, like, kidnapped twice. I don't even know. I don't... Hmm. Everybody congratulates Maxim on, like, getting married. <laughs> Thanks, Oliver. We shake, and I'm grateful he's been holding the fort. Oliver is always holding the fort. He runs everything. You just told Alessia that he does all of the work, and you're his boss. He goes into Kit's office. He decides that, like, now that he's Lord Trevithick, he's going to move into Kit's office, because it's, like, the main, the big one. And I have just my own little bugaboo on this. I am not going to even apologize for being picky about this. One wall is lined with books and various curios, a polo ball and trophies, a model Bugatti Veyron. Yeah, that's an ugly-ass car. That's the ugliest car I can think of. And he's got a model of it, so Kit doesn't have good taste, or didn't have good taste. That's the only thing. There's nothing technically wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with having these things, but just Kit liked an ugly car, and I want to just make sure everybody knows. I can't remember if I gave one of those to Neil and the boss. I feel like I did. I feel like he owned one. And I feel like it was commented on that it looked ugly. But that could have been the Pagani Zonda, because that one is also a very ugly car. 
The desk is ornate, with intricate carvings and an embossed black leather top. On his desk are more portraits in gilt frames of us, Carolyn, Jensen, and Healy, his beloved red setters. I, I read this as Carolyn, Jensen, and Healy being the beloved red setters. And I was like, that's so weird that he named a dog after his wife. That's not what is meant. That is not what is meant. So what it should have said is on his desk are more portraits in gilt frames of us, of Carolyn, and of Jensen and Healy, his beloved red setters. Because the way that it's written, Carolyn, Jensen, and Healy, his beloved red setters, it reads like Carolyn is one of the dogs. And we all know that she's a bitch, but she's not an Irish setter. Maxim says... Shall we get on with our meeting? We can do it at the rather fine Queen Anne table in here. Who does that? Who describes the furnishings of a room that they have been in before? It would be like me saying, Oh, put it on the Ikea bookshelf in my office. There's no other bookshelf in that. And like, put it on the rather sturdy Ikea bookshelf in my office. Mm -hmm. Put it on the heavy-duty plastic folding table by a rubber maid that's in the corner. Like, I don't... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Remember in Fifty Shades of Grey where I was like, there is no way that people are this interested in Christian Grey. He's just a billionaire. He just he's, he has a very kind of boring business. His, his business was not glamorous. Um, it, it just wasn't. It was all about, like, feeding people and helping people and blah, blah, blah. And nobody cares about that shit. That, it's just how the world works, right? And I was like, I cannot understand why paparazzi would be chasing them and hounding them. We have the same problem in this book, okay? Remember, this guy is the Lord of Trevithick or whatever. His estate has a thing in, like, the Cotswolds. He has a house in the Cotswolds. He has a house in Cornwall. There's one somewhere else, I think. And he is just, and then in the meantime, he's a photographer and a DJ. He's not a movie star. He's not a celebrity. He, he's literally like, like the younger brother of a guy who was a count. All right. And, and let's get back to E.L. James's thing where she is just convinced that everyone in the world is obsessed with British royalty, or and not like royalty people, everybody in the world is obsessed with British royalty, but that everyone in the world is obsessed with British nobility, and that they would be interested in the lives of all of these tiny, minute, little, you know, 900th from the throne people, right? Perhaps you should do a press release about your marriage. The tabloids are pestering our director of communications. Why? Why do the tabloids care? It's not like this is like Fergie's kids. It's not like it's like Beatrice and that other one. It's it's not like this is Meghan Markle and Harry. This is a guy who is a count who has like a few little estates. I do not believe that anyone gives a shit about his marriage outside of the estate itself. But here we are again that this is an author who cannot write characters who are not the most famous thing ever, okay? And this is another way that I feel um, that, that this is just a mashup of Poldark and that fanfic that we read on Patreon. Because in the fanfic on Patreon, there was the human trafficked housekeeper, Bella was a human trafficked housekeeper, and Edward was a big movie star. I don't want the press delving into the minutia of my marriage. I doubt that they want to. The only thing interesting really about your marriage is that you rescued someone from human trafficking. And that, I guess if you want to do a press release about, that would like make a more, that would like bring awareness to the topic that there is this human trafficking going on in Great Britain. That would be totally fine. But the, the idea here is that the public is going to be obsessed with their marriage and with his relationship and they are hanging on everything he does and that's just not realistic i mean okay yeah i don't live in england maybe it is but i feel like i would you know have heard of this i guess or i would have seen some of my friends from england be like obsessed with this if it was that big of a deal if, if that if being a low-level nobility was like 
this big, giant, like, Kardashian-like position. Alessia is in the apartment, sitting at Maxim's desk, using his iMac and trawling the internet. I don't believe that Alessia in this book could do so. I'm not saying I don't believe that an Albanian person couldn't use the internet, okay? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this particular character, we have seen her, like, think that debit cards are magic. So how is she on the computer? Again, we have been told that she had never seen a debit card, before, which is still the most infuriating thing, but that she had never seen a debit card before. But now she is on the internet and she's searching up all of this stuff about how to stop trafficking. Actually, she's looking at how to find, how to track a trafficked person. It's an impossible task. Now, you would think that she's saying it's an impossible task to find a trafficked person. Nope. It's an impossible task, especially as the intercom keeps buzzing. There are reporters outside wanting to speak to Maxim. There are reporters surrounding this. They're, they're in the building. There are reporters that are at the intercom that are buzzing the intercom, desperate to find out about this marriage. Like, I don't know why it is so crucial to E.L. James that her, um, that, that her, her characters have to be not just the center of each other's attention and not just the center of the story, but the center of the world's attention. If you want to do that, write about a celebrity. Write about someone who is super famous. You can't write about someone who is just a rando who happens to own a lot of land. She's feigned ignorance and is now listening to Angela Hewitt's interpretation of Bach's preludes and fugues from the well-tempered clavier through headphones. Alessa was surprised, Alessia was surprised to find that only a few women artists were featured in the classical albums on Apple Music. All right, I don't get why, because all we've heard about is the fact that she is a woman and should just be at home doing nothing, and that's the way she was raised, was just to tend to think, why does it surprise her? Jenny Trout, you are looking for consistency in a land where consistency cannot thrive. There's a whole thing we go into maxim's pov and he like is talking about the most boring shit ever like who's going to be the interior designer to finish some project and the fact that he'll be able to see his parents divorce settlement now because he's the master of whatever and he ignores his um he ignores his phone the whole time so when I glance at the screen, I'm astonished to find it crowded with a ton of text messages and missed calls. What the hell? You got married? When do we get to meet your wife? What's this I hear about you getting married? You'll find me off the market. My heart is broke. Maxim, you're hitched? What the... Not what the fuck. WTF, man? You wed? Who's the lucky girl? Can I get an interview with you and your bride? Shit. The last is from a journalist from one of the glossies. I fucked her back in the day. Oh, God. How do all these people know? You were right about the world knowing about my nuptials, I muttered to Oliver, who is gathering his papers together. It's not too late to put out a press release, he says. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. We're doing this. We're doing that. Everyone is obsessed with his. You needed to make him a prince. The world doesn't give a shit about any of the British nobility unless they are directly... Unless the queen is your grandmama, nobody gives a shit. He also has something from uh, Carolyn. Can we meet today? You need to see what I unearthed. It may affect you. What the fresh hell is this? Oh, sorry, what fresh hell is this? Can it wait? No. I'm dying to see what this is, because it probably has something to do with Alessia. It'll be something like, oh, I looked up your girlfriend, or I looked up your marriage, or I was innocently trying to sabotage your marriage, and I came across this, and it's, it's going to be perfect. So there's a knock on the door. He's like, come in. The, this assistant, Lisa, comes in and says, sorry to interrupt you. Lady Trevithick is here. And so he's like excited because he thinks it's Alessia. But it's 
Caroline. Caroline is still going by Lady Trevithick. Expecting someone else, Carolyn snipes. Your face has fallen several floors, darling. Yeah, he was expecting his wife because you gave his wife's title as like, never mind. So she is like, hey, I was around. Do you want to go for lunch? Like, no, ma'am, he's married. Back off. I've just got back and I'm busy, Caro. She laughs, a sad, sorry sound. You would never have said that back in the day. Yeah, because now he's like, like married and like, he's like, gotta like do the job that your husband used to do. You know, that husband that you had that you would rather have been fucking his brother. So the thing that she has, um, that she wants to show him is that she was going through Kit's papers and she found uh, something that she feels might concern him and, and Marianne. And it's that um, he, that Kit had gone for genetic counseling and she had no idea. Like she had no idea that he had gone in for genetic counseling. And so uh, Maxim starts reading the letters. If Kit's been referred for genetic counseling, it'll be for a reason. Oh shit, I feel the blood drain from my face. If Kit was facing a genetic medical issue, then I am too, surely. And Marianne. Hell, could there be something wrong with me? Yes, I've been saying that through the whole first book and this one. There is definitely something wrong with you. And if it's on a cellular level, I guess I completely could have seen that coming. Maxim's like, maybe I should get tested. Carolyn is like, for what? Because we don't have any idea, like, what he was being tested for. And then um, she says, it could just be that the doctor was trying to drive up the bill. Like, this, they apparently go to a doctor that frequently does all these unnecessarily unnecessary tests that drive up the bill, right? Like, why didn't you stop going to that doctor? Oh, Lord. So, he says, Did you mention this to Rowena? No, she flew back to New York as soon as we touched down from Tirana. You knew about this at the wedding? My voice has risen several octaves. Oh, if his voice has risen several octaves. You knew about this at the wedding? <laughs> oh, this is genuinely the most fun I've had with this book. <laughs> oh, oh. When I think of somebody's voice rising an octave or rising several octaves, I always think that, but it's always like when I write it, I'm always like, I mean that they're like, drinking because they're like so hot, like flames on the sides of my face, like that, right? But just the idea of it. I'm having so much fun. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right, Jenny, this isn't fun. This isn't fun. This is an E.L. James book. Carolyn's eyes widen, and I have my answer. And you didn't fucking tell me. I glare at her, suddenly livid. I might have something wrong with me, and I've just got married. All right, yeah, there's something wrong with you. We have already, yeah, there's a lot wrong with you. But also, like, you're mad that she didn't tell you about this at the wedding, okay? But I don't, like, I don't get how she would have known about it at the wedding, and that's, he gets that from what she says. Because... He says, did you mention this to Rowena? She says, no, she flew back to New York as soon as we touched down from Tirana. And you knew about this at the wedding? Well, no, what she's saying is they got back from the wedding and his mom left the country. His mom went to New York right after the wedding. So she still could have found all these letters and things after the wedding. And that's why she didn't tell. Like, I don't, that doesn't make any sense. Jenny, don't be a hero. Don't look for consistency in this book. Okay. Stop trying to make the book better than it is, Jenny. Stop trying to fix it in your mind because it's unfixable. Here's the thing that really bugs me. But before I can get really fucking angry, we're interrupted by a knock at the door, and Lisa enters carrying a tray with coffee. It gives me a moment to rein in my temper. Like, what was going to happen? Were you going to, like, fucking slap Caroline? Like, what? Like, oh, thank God the coffee arrived so I have a second to compose myself and, like, get rid of all this furious anger? I, 
why do they always have to be so angry? And also, why does he have to be so angry now that he's married? It seems like they've come back from the marriage thing and he's like so mad all the time. Like this is starting to really worry me. Um, Carolyn tried to get, she, she tried to get information. She called the genetic testing place and they wouldn't give her any information because even though she's next of kin. Um, I don't know how that works in the United States. You could probably get that information. I mean, not in the United States. I don't know how that works in the United Kingdom. You could probably get that information here in the States, but not, I mean, unless they didn't put you down, unless they specifically said, like, you know, you're not, a, you know, no. Oh, my landlord is mowing the lawn. He is not a count. So then he's like, well, maybe I can get some answers out of Dr. Renton because he's my GP too. Is that something, let me know in the comments, people from England, like, could you get information from your doctor about someone else? Because in the United States, you can't, but I know that laws are different everywhere. So maybe you, you can, I don't know. And it's not like you can tell from TV or anything like that because TV and movies always get that wrong. Like they like got like watch Grey's Anatomy sometime. Patient confidentiality. Dr. Bailey will be like walking down a hall past patient rooms and visitors and just be like screaming about somebody's diagnosis. Maxim, I'm sure it's nothing, Caroline says. How the hell do you know? I shout, rising from the table and to my shame, Caro flinches. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I want to scream. I'm as angry with her now as I was in Albania when I found out she told Alessia about us. I drag a hand through my hair and paste across the fucking antique Persian rug on the floor. Dude, get a grip. Yeah, dude, get a grip. For, first of all, I love that the Persian rug had to be like, it's like, okay, show, don't tell. Show that there's a Persian rug, don't tell. That there's. <laughs> but it's like the weirdest place to put it. Um, so, when she's like, I'm sure it's nothing, and he's like, how the hell do you know? Well, the answer here could be, I feel like my husband would have mentioned it if it was important, because, you know, he's my husband. But even though Marianne is a doctor, Maxim says, let me find out what we're dealing with here. She's my sister, and it's my fucking job to protect her. All right, well, she's a doctor, and you don't know shit about this, so maybe don't protect her. I don't know. Caro blows out a breath. Okay. The other thing we need to discuss is Kit's memorial. Not now. Well, I've spoken with the Dean of Westminster's office. And? They're suggesting a date in April. Isn't that a bit soon? Is it? Carolyn says. Oh, hell, Caro, I don't know. Let me think about it. This is a lot. Like, his brother died, like, eight weeks ago. I guess I don't understand funerary customs in the UK, but his brother died eight weeks ago, and he's like, oh, it's too soon. It's too soon to have a to have, have a, a, a memorial in, in April. We, I don't even know where we are in the story, so how far away is April? Does he mean April is too soon? But either way, it's been eight weeks since your brother died. That's what we heard in this book. Like, they didn't have time to do a memorial? and I don't know. That's another one for the comments. If you're from England, is it totally normal to just be like, no, we need to wait several months to have a memorial? He asks where Kit's laptop is and his phone and his journal, and she's like, I don't know. And he's like, why aren't they, like, with his possessions? Are they here? Can you check the safe at Trevelyan House? And Carolyn's like, oh, they might, they might not be there. I don't know if they're there. And she just, like, won't commit to checking. I rise to my feet, and we gaze at each other, and I'm wondering once more what Kit was doing on his motorcycle, racing through the trevithick lanes in the depths of an icy winter. Is she thinking the same? Was the news so bad that he took his own life? Fuck. I don't remember hearing about how icy it was. I thought it was rainy. I thought that it was, I thought that it was rainy. Maybe, I don't know. I've made a call to Kitts and my GP, Dr. Renton, and have an appointment to see him tomorrow. Hopefully I'll get some answers then. The genetic counseling clinic was not forthcoming at all, and the clinician dealing with Kit is on holiday. But I have an appointment in a couple of weeks to see her. I've even called my mother and left a message for her to call me, all to no avail. 
I can't believe how bewildering this news has been. There may be nothing wrong, but on the other hand, something awful could befall me as I get older. The thing that's going to befall you when you get older is death, and it happens to everybody. Oh, Lord. As I round the corner of Tite Street onto the embankment, I spy a few people, mainly men, hanging around the entrance to my building. Wait, these are not people. Three of the shambolic riffraff are holding cameras. Paparazzi! Oh, fuck, they're after me. Lord Trevithick, Lord Trevithick, Maxim, congratulations. Care to comment on your marriage, your bride? When do we meet her? And then he just like kind of he, like like he he walks through them with his head down, goes into the building while people are like getting all like in his face as if this is some big new. I need to know. I need to know if this is realistic. Again, anyone from England, let me know if you give a shit about people like counts and you want to see them in the papers and people are so desperate to see a count that they would, um, that paparazzi would waste their time in London where there are actual famous people and like actual royalty. Why paparazzi would waste their time trying to get a picture of this guy because they get paid by the picture. How much is a picture of a count? How much is a picture of like a low level nobility worth? in England. Like, is this really something that y'all are obsessed with to the point that paparazzi would chase them? Anytime, I, I just, I don't understand why E.L. James won't just write about famous people, like legitimately famous people, like a rock star or a movie star or something like that. Why do they have to be like billionaires or the landed gentry and paparazzi are obsessed with them? She has this real issue with believing somehow that normal human beings just worship the rich and, and want to know every detail of every rich person's life. It's so weird and so, I don't know. Here we go. I've not been accosted by any journalist since I was with Charlotte, an ex-girlfriend. She loved attention. As an actor, sorry, no. An artist, she liked to style herself. She lapped it up, especially from the press. I rolled my eyes at the memory. She was socially ambitious and hideously pretentious. Oh, God, I can't imagine anybody hideously pretentious hanging out with you. She loved attention, M-dash, as an actor, ellipses. Sorry, no, an artist, as she liked to style herself, M-dash. She put an ellipses in a part of a sentence that was M dashed already. You cannot tell me that she did not read a ton of M dash fantasy before this. She was like eating it up. She was like reading like all, all of Sarah J Maas. She just started on a court of thorns and roses and she barreled through that and she barreled through throne of glass. She is, she's on Crescent City right now because this normal, this doesn't happen to people. This, 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 people don't, ha that doesn't happen to people, okay? It's, it's after they read those books and the M-dashes arrive. There are so many M-dashes and the fact that she has managed to combine M-dashes and ellipses, it's like, honestly, Sarah J. Moss, game is over for you. Game over. Remember how he said that this actress who he, he feels like should not call herself an artist, because, like, he, he feels it's ridiculous that she styles herself as an artist, right? Apart from my time with her, I've managed to avoid being tabloid fodder, but I'll get the occasional mention in the social diary columns of more discerning publications. He's like, oh, she's hideously pretentious, or whatever. And then he's like, well, yeah, that's hideously pretentious, but I am featured in more discerning publications that don't, you know, traffic with actors and actresses and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, sir, you're a DJ. He gets home. He hears that Alessia is playing the piano. It's Claire de Lune. He's like, oh, I can play that because God forbid. And then, uh, then he's like, oh, yeah, but not as good as her, basically. He sits next to her at the piano, okay? And I have an idea. I hover my right hand over hers, and she immediately understands what I'm trying to do. She withdraws her hand, and I take over. 
We stumble over the few notes, but I watch her left hand following her lead, and we continue the piece together. God forbid she have something of her own. You have to prove to everybody in the book that Maxim also can play the piano really well, uh, because God forbid that Alessia have anything of her own or be a character who stands on her own with distinctive qualities. Now, Maxim also has to play the piano really, really good. All right, and then they kiss, and she sits in his lap and says, I've missed you. And they have to go to the immigration lawyer. Oh, man, I really hope that we have to go to the immigration lawyer with them. She hands me our passports, our marriage certificate, and the apostille issued by the notary in Tirana, confirming our marriage certificate is legitimate. I slip them all in my jacket pocket, then frown. There's a slight problem. We've been besieged by press outside. Um, so... They're gonna go see if this marriage is legitimate, I guess. I can't wait to hear about how it's not, because Albania is primitive and crooked and just full of crime. They go on to the fire escape to get out. They're sneaking out because they're so surrounded by paparazzi. It's ridiculous. They can't even leave. They are so the big story of the moment that they can't even leave their house. Sure. And as they're escaping, she thinks about the fact that like the last time they were on the fire, she was on the fire escape, she was trying to run away from the human traffickers. Oh, good. We do go to the immigration lawyer with them. Okay, so they get there, and they're told that Tisha Kavanaugh will be with them, and that too, someone at the thing has wanted, somebody he knows has recommended her, because she's an expert. The door opens before I've sat down, and Tisha Kavanaugh enters. She's wearing an expensive black suit and a white silk blouse. In her hand, she clutches a legal paper pad, her scarlet nails vivid against the canary yellow. Oh, shit. We stare at each other in instant recognition. The last time I saw her, I'd just untied her from my bed. Could this day hold any more surprises? Well, how did you not know? Like, did you not know her name? Did you not, like, know her name? And then, like, in front, and he's like, oh, shit. And then, like, in front of Alessia, he's like, says, how nice to see you again. And then that's the, that is the chapter hook. Leticia, how nice to see you again. And that's the chapter hook. So, um, the big suspense that we're ending on is that the immigration lawyer is someone he has fucked before. I just... I just don't know what book we're reading. She wants him to be a DJ and a photographer. Um, but he has all of this disdain for an actress. Uh, she wants him to be a celebrity, but also like, just like a count, which it, it doesn't sound like a celebrity thing, right? So I don't know exactly what this book is supposed to be, and I don't know why I'm supposed to be interested in continuing to read it, because now we had a plot that was, oh no, she had, you know, this girl has to figure out how to be uh, a countess. Now we have a plot of, oh no, we have to rescue someone from human trafficking. That's the plot that I'm interested in, right? Then we have, oh no, um, there might be a genetic disease. And then, oh no, uh, I fucked this immigration lawyer. Like, I don't know exactly what... And, and of course, we have the plot of uh, Caroline trying to steal Maxim away, which, again, is like, you know, it hasn't been laid out, completely laid out, but we know that that's going to be a part of the plot. So, I honestly, it's we're at chapter 13. We're how many percentage into the book? 38% into the book, and all this stuff has been introduced. And more stuff just keeps getting introduced, but there's not really any forward momentum on the things that have been introduced. It's like, it's like dropping a plot and you're like, okay, this is going to be the plot. And then you move on and like, here's another plot. And then like, oh, here's another plot. But we don't get forward momentum on any of these things. And I don't know, is it all going to get wrapped up in the last 70%? I know that I'm, you know, being ungenerous because when we get to, you know, we're not even at the halfway point yet, but it just still feels like a lot. It feels like a lot is happening and 
things just keep getting added. Just now there's paparazzi they have to run from. Now there's, you know, we have to find Blariana. There's all, there's all of this stuff and it just more and more keeps getting piled on, but the author does not seem to be interested in any of these plots because in the next chapter a new plot immediately pops up. I, I, I'm just, I have no idea what this book is about. I have no idea why this book exists because the first book was a standalone. They got there happily ever after. He rescued her. So what is the point of this book other than to fulfill a contract? Um, I know that the party line was that people were demanding a follow-up to this, you know, epic love story and, and this, you know, romance to end all romances, the greatest love of all time ever committed to Paige. Uh, next chapter, I guess we're still at the damn lawyer's office. I wish I hadn't joked about having to go there, but here we are. And uh, yeah, I'll catch you on the flip side.